In 2009, 11 women and one unborn child was discovered in the West Mesa area in Albuquerque, New Mexico. These women were all minorities or S workers or linked to an S worker by family. Two of the victims were only 15 years young. The Albuquerque Police Department considers the West Mesa murders as an active investigation, but as time flies by, it seems as if less and less that the city knows what happened. It even seems less likely that they would even learn who killed the women or whether these were the only bodies in the West Mesa area. Did the West Mesa killer intentionally target black and brown women? Or did they intentionally target S workers in the area? Do you think the killer was caught? Or are they still wreaking havoc in our community? Hey y'all, hey, we are back with another SW and True Crime video. I just want to say thank y'all so much for all the love on my previous videos and just thank y'all for the continuous support, all the comments. Um, I actually had a fan on my OF comment that they were loving my videos and that just means so much. <clears throat> because I was honestly posting these videos for the SW community, but I'm just so grateful that everybody else can just see what's going on in the community period and just be more insightful and more aware and honestly just, you know, help someone else that you may know in the community or just anybody you know that could be affected by the stories that I tell. So, um, life update. Life has been super crazy. I know it's been a long, long time since I've done one of these. Um, actually, this case may be a two-parter, so my first two-part case. But, um, just check out my previous vlogs if you want to know. I'm going to put out another vlog so I can give y'all a rundown about everything that's been happening in my life. Because it's been crazy. But, yeah. Sorry, Cassius. <laughs> Drinking water and eating food at the same time, y'all. But, okay. Let's get back into it. Before I start, I just want to give my condolences to the family. And again, I mean no disrespect for the things I'm about to say. Um, before I start, I just want to say also, this is my first serial killer case. Crazy, right? This is my first one. So this may be a two-parter. Um, it might be a little different than all my other previous cases because again, this is an active case one. Two, it's a serial killer, and three, it's 11 women, and it's a lot, a lot of information. I've researched this information, and all the information is public information, and all of my resources will be linked below. Again, this is an ongoing case, so there isn't much information, but there are many possible suspects, and I'll be covering a few. Possibly, the perpetrator is still at large, so please be aware of the information I'm about to tell you guys. Disclaimer, this case will mention um, children. So if you are not, you know, in the mind frame to hear about children being involved in true crime, this is your time to exit out now and watch some of my other previous videos. I completely understand. Again, it is very dangerous for everyone, not only S workers. Please be careful and aware of your surroundings. All right. Let's get into our next case. February 2nd, 2009, Christine Ross decided to walk her dog, Ruka, in a upcoming housing development area. But at the time it was not developed, it was just a bunch of dirt and cement blocks. As they were walking along the unfinished houses, Ruka goes to something interesting. Her dog, Ruka, approaches something that's coming out of the ground. At first, it had seemed like he was just excited to be running in an open area. But once his owner got closer to Ruka, 
she could see that he was excited that he found something. In the darkness, it looked like it could have been a piece of wood or something that the construction workers might have left. Well, the closer Ruka and their owner got, the odder it looked. Ruka returns this item back to Christine, and from far away, it didn't look that odd. But as Ruka got closer, it looked like a bone. Thinking that the bone looked strange, Christine sent a picture to her sister, who's a nurse. When Christine received confirmation that it was a human femur bone or thigh bone, she immediately called 911. Discovered by an unlikely hero, Christine Ross and her dog Ruka were together for almost 15 years. Their bond made even stronger through Ruka's discovery. She found a human bone on a walk, but little did they know there would be many more. For long, police had begun excavating the entire lot, which would be the largest crime scene in Albuquerque. Within a month, they had successfully identified four of the victims, which were all S workers that had been gone missing years prior. But several more bodies were unidentified, as well as their prospective killer. The crime scene, which police called one of the largest crime scene in American history, required teams of investigators working around the clock to coordinate to dig. They used heavy equipment to move massive amounts of dirt and hand sifted through dirt to get a closer look to search for evidence. More than two dozen detectives began collaborating with anthropologists, medical investigators, and volunteers in effort to comb through the area, slowly excavating the region around where they found the singular bone. This area in particular would be Albuquerque's 118th Street. Not surprisingly, they did find bones, some of which were as far as 15 feet underground but they were not prepared for the amount of bones they would find. Many of the bones that police would discover in this extensive dig had been left partially intact, but the others had been scattered about by the workings of the failed housing development. The end result was a morbid puzzle on a grand scale of trying to piece these bodies that were scattered everywhere back together in one piece to be a complete skeleton. It quickly became clear to investigators that there was more than just one body. Several bodies had been buried in the same vicinity as the other, which detectives found as an unlikely coincidence. In fact, it was most likely that this was done by a singular killer instead of a group who had used this isolated or once isolated place as a dumping ground. Now with two out of the potentially dozen or so bodies being identified, it was harder and harder for police to avoid saying that there was a serial killer on the loose. Police were actually hesitant to let the public or the press know of their findings. All the bones were found in the same 10 by 30 yard patch of ground, which is about the same distance in meters. Some of the bones had been scattered away from others, while others were perfectly intact. But several of the human remains had been disturbed by construction projects that had dug up the ground and kind of flattened it so it can be a house on the property. Ultimately, a lot of the bones found were either very hard to identify or they couldn't find an identifiable bone to help find out who it was. For example, one of the bodies had no skull and one of the remains that was found had no dental records at all. The press conference held February 25th, 2009, Albuquerque Police Chief Ray Schultz declared the West Mesa crime scene as one of the largest crime scenes in Albuquerque history, which he later amended 
because they found out that it was true. This was the largest crime scene in the city's history. During this press conference, he stated about the ongoing investigation. We have linked two of the victims with similar lifestyles now. That gives detectives a good place to start. This is where the real work begins. At some point in time, their lives crossed paths, whether it was each other or some other individual involved in their deaths. Due to estimates made by the medical examiner, the bodies the police were finding had been buried for less than a decade. So it was believed that this killer, whoever they were, were likely to be active in the early 2000s. This hypothesis was based off of a list of women that went missing between 2001 and 2006. Thankfully, the list of missing S workers in Albuquerque made it easy for police to windle down possible matches. Family members and other loved ones who had been trying to raise awareness to the police, to other law enforcement about these missing women, but they were a little too late. Law enforcement, as usual, has shown again and again that they had little interest in following up on any of their potential leads or any of these leads. However, one Albuquerque detective, Ida Lopez, had showed an interest in the missing women many, many months before the bodies were found. In fact, years before the first bone was found in the pit, which was the name of the area that they were finding the remains in. This detective had put together a running list of missing ex-workers that had disappeared over a short period of time in the area. That list which compiled of missing S workers, as well as the information she had gathered in the creation stages of the case, will go on to lead the rest of the investigation. Good evening. We're digging into the West Mesa murders, a string of killings nobody knew had even happened until a woman walking her dog came across a femur bone sticking out of the ground in Albuquerque's West Mesa in 2009. I still can't believe it. I still think about it every day. A call to police led to the gruesome discovery of the remains of 11 women and one unborn child. Their bodies were in shallow graves scattered across a 100 acre plot of land being prepared for development. Almost all of the women were Hispanic. All of them had connections to prostitution and drugs, and they had all been reported missing between 2002 and 2005. It quickly became clear that local police were likely dealing with a serial killer, Albuquerque's first. But so unlike all of my other cases, I will be giving y'all insight on each and every one of the victims in this case. In 2009, authorities uncovered the bodies of 11 women over a two month period. It took almost a year to identify all of the victims and the bones did not lead a clear indication of how the victims were killed. However, the police suspect that it could have been possibly strangulation. The fact that the bodies were found in a group led investigators to believe that they were killed by one person. A serial killer who has come to be known as the West Mesa Bone Collector. In this case, we have 11 victims who identified as women and one unborn child. Two out of the 11 victims were 15 years old. I will not be discussing their information, though it is public information, but I just want to respect the child as well as the parent of the victim. In mid-2005, Albuquerque police detective Ida Lopez had noticed that women with either drug charges or S worker solicitation charges had been going missing. I'll be giving the names of the victims now. Sorry if I mispronounce. Monica Candelaria, Cinnamon Elks, Veronica Romero, Victoria Chavez, Michelle Valdez, Virginia Cloven, Julie Nieto, Evelyn Salazar, Jamie Barella, and Doreen Marquez were found buried on the Mesa in 2009, along with Solania Edwards, 
who hadn't been reported missing in Albuquerque at all. Monica Candelaria was 21 or 22 when she disappeared in 2003. Her obituary reads, Monica enjoyed laughing, joking, taking care of babies, and spending time with her family. She will be remembered as a loving daughter, mother, granddaughter, niece, cousin, and friend who will truly be missed. She was last seen near Atrisco in Central and Southwest Albuquerque. Deputies said she lived a high-risk lifestyle and may have had gang ties. She had got into some trouble involving full service escort. When the 21-year-old never showed up, detectives turned it over to the Bonilio, I think that's how you say it, County Sheriff's Department cold case unit. This case was cold until she was identified as one of the victims found in the Mesa in 2009. Cinema Elks, who was just 32 when she had went missing, was the third victim to be identified in the Mesa. She, like many others in this case, was a known S worker in the area and had multiple solicitation arrests. When Diana Wilhelm didn't hear from her daughter on her birthday in August 2004, she knew something was wrong. But it would take nearly five years for police to confirm what Diana had already believed. Cinnamon was already dead. She was friends with at least three other victims in the case. Gina Michelle Valdez, Victoria Chavez, and Julie Nito. Veronica C. Romero was 32 when she was reported missing by her family on Valentine's Day in 2004. Her family laid her to rest in July 2009 after the news broke. It was rumored that she was also a local S worker in the Albuquerque area. Her family member's spiritual sister told KLB TV, the local news station, we're putting her to rest finally. But considering what has been done, and now we're finding out more of what's happened to her, and it's sad. Victoria Chavez, 26, was the first woman whose bones were identified after they were found on the Mesa. Before the public learned the women were likely murdered by a serial killer. To have them come and knock on my door, I was devastated, her stepfather Ambrose Saya said at the memorial event in 2009. I never thought it would end like this. I just had hope. Her mother reported her missing in March 2005 after she hadn't seen her for more than a year. The mother also said in the missing persons report that Chavez, Victoria, was on probation and was a drug user and an S worker. The last time Dan Valdez had talked to his daughter, Michelle Valdez, he asked her to not stay away too long. She walked up and put her arms around me and hugged me. I hugged her back and she said, no dad, hug me hard and tight. Her father said in a 2015 interview, it seemed as if she knew something was gonna happen. Michelle had a daughter who she cared for deeply. She was known to be family oriented, good hearted, and honestly the type to give you the shirt off of her back if you needed it. Her family doesn't recall when specifically she got involved in drugs, but she started disappearing for days, sometimes week at a time. Later, it turned to months. Dan Valdez reported her missing in February 2005 when Michelle was only 22. Valdez's daughter, Michelle, is one of those victims, a friendly young woman who Valdez says loved to sing. She was just 22 at the time. I miss her. I miss her terribly, and so does uh, the whole family does. Her bones were the second set to be identified in late February 2009 after investigators started digging up for more bodies. They also discovered the remains of Michelle Valdez, four month old unborn child. Again, it was known that Michelle was a known S worker in the Albuquerque community. You believe they're gonna solve this case? Mm hmm yeah. Uh, if you have enough time, I think they will. Virginia Cloven grew up in a small trailer heated by wood burning stove in Los Chavez, New Mexico. She was funny, loved doing her makeup, and was a favorite at school. She was a really humorous girl and she would take everything in stride, her dad Robert Cloven said in a 2015 interview. 
she would try to lie to you and then come and tell you the truth two minutes late. But tragedy struck the family when she was in high school. Her brother was shot and killed in a homicide that would later be ruled as self-defense. Virginia then ran away from home a week later when she was 17. Her other brother ran away as well. At first, Virginia Cloven lived with her grandfather in Albuquerque, but then moved in with her boyfriend. He sadly got hit by a car and went into a coma, and soon Virginia Cloven had lost her home and was living on the streets of Albuquerque's International District. One year, she called and asked her father what did he want for his birthday. He told her all he wanted for his birthday was for her to clear up his citations and that they would meet for his birthday in Albuquerque. After Virginia was nowhere to be found, Robert Cloven and his wife searched high and low for his daughter. They taped pictures of her all over the city and even searched some of the seedier parts of the city. They last heard from her in June 2004. She called to say she had a new boyfriend who had just got out of prison and she was probably going to marry him. We said we'd like to meet him, but we never heard from her again, Robert said in 2009. After that, everything just went dead. Robert Cloven reported his daughter missing four months later in October 2004. She was 23 at the time when she was found in the West Mesa. Showed up on his doorstep to tell him. Your daughter is definitely one of the people that's passed away from the West Mesa murders. Virginia and Cloven vanished in 2004, just years after Cloven's son was murdered. With a son gone and daughter missing, things like holidays lost all meaning. It's hard to set up a tree. Excuse me. And you know there's nobody to share it with. After years of wondering, he finally knows Virginia is not missing anymore. As a child, Julie Nito was always small for her age. So small that her mom said that she would often alter or sew her clothes smaller to fit Julie. She grew up at Albuquerque's South Valley and lost Loomis and loved chili peppers and jump rope. She went to the Job Corp, which teaches underprivileged young people different professions to find a better fit for them. Her mom, Eleanor Grigo, said Julie started doing drugs when she was around 19 years of age. She tried to get her treatment to no avail. Julie was also a local S worker in Albuquerque. Her mother says the last time she saw Julie was when she was 23 in August of 2004 at Grigo's dad's house. She left behind a young son who she dotted over. Two years after Julie went missing, her sister Julie Nito was found dead in her motel room, presumably from an overdose. Their mother found out that Julie was one of the girls found in the West Mesa area shortly after that. I was expecting it. I already had made myself didn't know that it was her up there. I didn't want it to be that kind of news, but I rather had found, had her found than still sit here wondering where she's at. I got the closure when Ida told me they found Julie. That was my closure on that part. But to find out who did it to her, that's the closure I need. Doreen Marquez loved jewelry and fashionable clothes and had a huge personality, according to her friends and family. She went to West Mesa High School where she was a cheerleader and later had two daughters who she was extremely devoted to. And she would also throw them extravagant birthday parties. But as her daughters got older, Doreen's boyfriend was arrested and Doreen later ran to drugs. She spent less and less time with her daughters, leaving them with her sister or other family members. Like she was this drug addict or whatever they wanted. Her lifestyle was like that her whole life. It was She would always make sure, even if she didn't leave them overnight, do you have food? Do you have this for the kids? Her good friend, Frederica Garcia, said that the last time she saw Doreen, she told her that she could help her with her addiction but she refused. She was around 27 when she disappeared, her friends say. Police reported that she was last seen dropping her child off at the Calvary Christian Academy on Lead Southeast near University in October, 2003.
but a friend later contradicted that, stated that she was last seen in Barrelas, New Mexico. I made a vow that I was going to start searching for her, so I started putting posters up, calling everybody. I went walking down the hood where she was at, asking people. I contacted her ex-boyfriend. Nobody's heard from her. Nobody. I had made about three reports, and they didn't even have them in file. Even uh, Ida Lopez, she didn't even know that I had made those police reports. And then she dug it in, dug into it, and she found them, and they weren't even completed. They just didn't put no interest into it at all, and they still have it. And we didn't get no nothing, no kind of answers, no nothing until the dog Ruka found the bone up there on the west side. I knew she was there. I had an interview before they even identified any of the girls. And when I stepped foot on that land over there on the West Mesa, I felt like my sister's hands came out of the dirt and just <laughs> held me there and was like, I'm here, don't go. Unlike many of the other victims that were found in the West Mesa area, Doreen isn't suspected to be an S worker, but it was hinted that she may have dabbled in S work. And it took him six years to find her and all them girls? That just don't make no sense, man. Evelyn Salazar was reported missing on April 3rd, 2004 by her family. She was 23 when she disappeared. She was the 10th victim to be identified. And her 15-year-old cousin, Jamie Barella, was the last victim to be identified. The two were last seen together at a family outing and then went to a park at San Mateo in Gibson in April 2004. Evelyn liked camping and outdoor activities, was a good cook, and taught her daughter how to roller skate, according to her obituary. Neither women had been seen again until their bones had been recovered and identified in the West Mesa lot in 2009. Mother herself is also a West Mesa victim. It's real hard because I've been waiting for five years to hoping that she's going to come back and then. For 13 year old Mariah and her seven year old sister, March 2004 was the last time they saw their mother. Making it more tragic, Evelyn Salazar was reportedly with her cousin Jamie Barella when she went missing. That leaves Jamie's mom wondering if her daughter will be the next and final victim identified. And until I hear that Jamie's gone, I'm going to be strong. Jamie Barella was the last skeleton to be identified almost a year later after the first bone was found. Unlike the other West Mesa victims, Jamie was not an S worker. She was just a 15 year old child with her cousin. Last but not least, Solania Edwards stands apart from the rest of the West Mesa victims. She had no known family or friends and was a known runaway from foster care in Lawton, Oklahoma. She was only 15 years old and the only black victim out of all of the women. The Office of the Medical Examiner says once it came up with a sketch of Edwards, it scoured national databases looking for a match. Like the rest of these victims, Celania was an S worker, sadly but in Colorado. Early in the investigation, an anonymous tip told investigators Solania was last seen or seen in Denver in spring, summer of 2004. The tipster said she had been at a motel on East Colfax Street in Denver. Police believe she may have been traveling with the group. Continuing investigations have uncovered eight more missing women whose disappearances may have been connected to the murders, maybe even victims of the same serial killer. Their names are as follows. Martha Luther, 32. Anna Vigil, 20. Felipa Gonzalez, 23. Nina Heron, 21. Jillian Ortez Henderson, 19. Chantel Whites, or Waits, 29. Leah Pebbles, 23. And Vanessa Reed, 24. All eight women were reported missing between 2005 and 2006, a year after the first group of women disappeared. Like the first 10 of the missing women, they either had known drug charges, frequent drug users, or were local S workers in the area. 
thank y'all so much for tuning in to part one of the West Mesa Bone Collector Case. Um, part two will be coming up soon. I actually did this whole video all at once and I thought I could condense it into one video, but that's why I'm in different clothes because I honestly, it wasn't happening. Anymore, so. um, but yeah, thank y'all so much for tuning in. Um, share your thoughts. Tell me what you think below. Um, I know it's a lot, um, but make sure you give me a like, comment, subscribe, and make sure you turn on that notification bell to know when I'm posting more true crime cases. Also, comment what cases you would like me to cover. Um, even if it's local cases, I would love to cover smaller cases as well. But yeah, see you soon. Stay safe, y'all. Bye.